Tanya Gomez. I'm a registered licensed dietitian. I've worked here for a very long time. I used to work in the dietary department and corporate community health promotion. Now I am strictly in corporate and community health promotion. So I go out into the community quite a bit. I do a lot of the fitness stuff. Um, and we are here to educate. This is Joe Crossgrove Murillo. She works in dietary and corporate and community health promotion. She's worked here a long time as well. We are going to talk about cooking with substitution foods, uh, not just sugar, fat, salt, um, but actual cooking substitutions with real foods. Why substitute foods? I think it's very important um, that we substitute foods because a lot of people want to use the word diet. They tend to think that dieting helps them lose weight, be a little bit healthier. It's just a negative word. Diets usually aren't sustainable. You can see the first three letters aren't very fun. So, you know, we really encourage people to not diet and not think of a different kind of eating as a healthier lifestyle and not as a diet because of that reason. We're also looking at better health. We want to substitute foods. We want to eat a little bit better. We want to focus on natural foods and fiber. We want to use more foods. Natural foods taste good. We like them. It gives us positive energy, and it's more sustainable. When we actually learn how to eat healthier, it is more sustainable. It's more achievable. We're leaning towards a culture of wellness, and this is what we want to do. We don't want to be stuck on that diet and do it, not do it, because it just is not a sustainable thing, and you're going to have a lot more success and be a lot healthier um, substituting foods and eating natural foods. So we're going to start with carbohydrates and kind of some substitutions you can do with that. Um, we're going to start with sugar, and you know a lot of times people will uh, want to avoid, and it's probably not a bad idea to avoid artificial sugars or processed sugars, I guess we should say, um, but some sugars we do want. Uh, if you're substituting sugar in a recipe that you have, uh, what we encourage you often to do is to just substitute half of it uh, if you're using an artificial sweetener. One of the reasons for that is that things like Splenda and Equal um, that you can bake with and prepare don't have the properties of sugar. They don't provide the structure that sugar would provide, nor do they provide the, the browning, the coloring that happens in a product. So I, I love that we have the pillars here because I always <laughs> describe that, you know, sugar in a lot of products acts just like this. If we took this out, I don't want to stand right here. Uh, sugar is part of what makes your product stand as it does or hold like it does. And so uh, sometimes when we decrease, it's better to just take part of it out uh, and then replace partly with an equal or a Splenda in baking. Also just reducing in general, you can use less sugar a lot of times in a recipe where you're still gonna have good quality or you can replace it with a, few, a fruit puree is another option. Uh, flour is another thing where we can do some substitution. Uh, white flour typically is kind of the powdery stuff from the inside of a little wheat seed, uh, but it has gluten, so it has something that also creates structure. So if we do away completely with our white flour and we go to all whole wheat flour, wheat flour is going to have that bran and that germ that creates a little bit more weight in the product. So if we did 100% whole wheat bread, it would probably only raise about this much uh, just because it's a very heavy product. And so a lot of times what we need to do if you're doing like a bread or a cookie is you want to do part. Again, maybe half white, half whole wheat flour. So we're getting that extra fiber, those extra uh, benefits, but we're still going to have the gluten that comes as part of the powdery white flour to give us that lift. You can also do alternate flours. You can play with soy flour, rice flour, coconut flour. I mean, there's a whole gamut of flours out there now. And again, what they're not going to have a lot of times is the gluten that gives them the structure. Um, so I encourage people to um, use multiple flours if you're going to try different things, or maybe you do a little bit of three or four different flours in a product. Um, and if you're going to do without white flour completely or wheat flour, you may need to add some dough enhancers to help that product uh, be in a good, you know, con consistency that you want. Also, when we talk about simple carbohydrates, when we talk about, you know, store-bought cookie, you know, can we replace it with something more complex? You know, can I make a cookie where I can put oatmeal and raisins and nuts into it so I've increased that fiber content and made it just a little bit better? Um, we're going to talk about today 
a, a rice replacement. We can take plain white rice. Again, it's kind of the basic product, not as much nutrition. We could replace it with something like quinoa that's going to give some protein. It's gonna give some more fiber. They have kind of the same quinoa and rice are sort of bland if you make them plain. You do have to season both of them. I mean, a bowl of plain white rice isn't that exciting, but you put some flavorings with it and it can be made uh, to be tasty. Uh, so that's what we're going to demonstrate, or the other thing we're going to demonstrate is we're going to replace rice with cauliflower. So we're going to do as our demonstration a cauliflower fried rice. And we're going to kind of do it as we talk, but we're going to do it a little bit closer to the end so that you can sample it. Uh, but those are some things you can do to make, uh, add some more complexity, some more fiber to the carbohydrates that you're using. And then, of course, we're going to talk about dietary fiber. Dietary fiber is important for so many reasons. Um, no matter what you're using it for, a lot of people will use it to uh, control their blood sugars, um, to keep them regulated, um, to help them feel fuller longer. Because when you eat fiber, it's a bulky substance. It swells when you eat it. The recommended is 25 to 35 grams per day. And I think a lot of people tend to not get that. So we're, we're going to talk about ways that you can increase that dietary fiber by eating real foods and also the substitutions that you can use to just give yourself a little bit more fiber uh, because it can also help you lose weight. So there's a lot of different reasons for increasing your fiber intake. Um, we want to encourage a lot of whole grains. You want to incorporate those because those will give you a lot more fiber um, versus like eating, let's say, for example, you've got pasta, you've got rice, you've got cereals. If you're eating more of the refined things, you don't get that fiber. So if you're incorporating more whole grains or you see those labels where they're made with more whole grains and you're getting more fiber, those things are going to be a little bit healthier, more beneficial for you. So you want to try to add those whole grains whenever you can. Adding fruits and vegetables is huge. You know, technically we should be eating five to nine gram, or five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables every single day, which means we should be eating those foods for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and even snacks to get those in. And a lot of times when I am seeing patients in counseling, I will ask them if they eat fruits and vegetables, and they tell me, well, I like them. And I said, well, it's great, do you, you like them, but are you eating them? And most of the time they do like them, but they're just not eating very many. Maybe they're lucky to eat one a day, or they do eat one a day. Maybe they eat it for lunch, maybe they eat a banana for breakfast, and they really think that that is enough when it truly isn't. We should be incorporating fruits and vegetables with every meal. Nuts, beans, and legumes are another great way to add dietary fiber. You can also add some protein with those. They're a great complex carbohydrate. So uh, when you get those nuts, you're getting fiber, you're getting protein, you eat beans, you get fiber, you eat legumes, you can get that fiber. So there's a lot of different ways, and sometimes people don't know how to use those things and how to incorporate those foods into their meal plans. But you can find a lot of different recipes. You can do a lot of different things to incorporate those with the current foods that you are eating. So a lot of times you want to take a look at what is your current meal? What do you need to add? What do you need to take away to make it better rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and creating completely different meals? Look at what you're currently doing. Figure out what you need to change. When we look at protein, um, some different things we can do to substitute um, to make better choices with protein is we can choose things that are leaner. Thank you. Uh, so leaner options, we could use things like ground chicken or turkey instead of ground beef. And we can use ground beef, we can rinse it off and do things that help it to be a little bit leaner. Uh, we can choose you know, poultry without skin on it. We can choose baked or grilled fish um, just to help that be a little bit less uh, fat and calories coming in for us. Um, other options are to use beans. We could replace our protein sources with beans, um, or we could put beans with our protein sources. And probably one of my favorite examples is, um, because you know we don't have to all be plant-based, but we grow our own um, beef. So I like to use that, and we like to prepare it in ways that doesn't have a lot of fat. But the thing I've been doing lately is I mix a pound of ground hamburger, and I found this really cool way. I cook it all ahead and put it in little dishes, so it's really fast. I also like quick and convenient. We put that with a can of black beans. So uh, I have little foster kids and they came pretty much, I'm sure, not eating anything but processed foods. And um, they've probably eaten more beans in the last couple months than their whole life because it just comes as part of our meat. And I have not once heard a complaint, which is pretty cool if you can get little kids to eat beans and not complain. So I might take that and we might make uh, spaghetti sauce or tacos or whatever. But it's just kind of a neat way to still use the hamburger but also have that higher uh, fiber bean with it. So kind of a unique example. Uh, mixing vegetables also with your protein sources is a really good option. Um, Tanya and I have both done some 
uh, meatloaf and sloppy joe type uh, meals where we mixed in little pieces of vegetable. We chop them really fine. Uh, you can do carrots, peppers, onions, really kind of whatever's in your refrigerator. Uh, Tanya has a great story. She doesn't like mushrooms, so I just have to tell this story. So she pureed them. So just ground them up completely in the blender, put them in as part of that sloppy joe. You couldn't tell there was a mushroom and she could even eat it. So it's kind of exciting. I took a huge kettle of sloppy joe mix to uh, 18 teenagers one time and you know that's a lot of people to feed a whole bunch of beef to so we chopped up I don't know how many pounds of carrots celery onions peppers and really tiny little teeny tiny pieces sauteed them down they're probably about the same size as the hamburger you know and then you put your sloppy joe uh, mixture with it and I have heard not one complaint from teenagers which again is kind of amazing to have teenagers eat and not complain about vegetables being in there so again it's just kind of a unique way to make our products better. You can also use plant protein, uh, so again, like the beans, but seeds, <coughs> nuts, those are great things to add in. Uh, you can add seeds and nuts to salads. If you're a little crazy, you can even try tofu. Uh, it's basically a bean curd, and you can use it like chicken. You can use it in stir fries. Um, and nice thing with tofu, it takes the flavor of what it's with. So you season it with some spices, you know, you can make an Indian dish, you can make a Mexican dish, you know, any flavor with it. I'm not saying you have to do that, but these are options. It's ways to just have that little bit less fat still have great protein sources. Fat is another nutrient that we want to talk about. It's very important. Our body needs some of it. We just don't need a lot of it, and sometimes we tend to overdo that. So when we are choosing fats, we want to make sure that we're selecting heart-healthy fats. It doesn't matter what kind of fat we eat or what kind of fat that we consume. It's still a high-calorie uh, nutrient, so we want to make sure that when we do, we're still watching the portion control we have. We have a couple different, we have an olive oil here sitting on the table, and while it might be healthier, it doesn't mean that you want to just use as much of it as you can possibly get because somebody told you that it was healthy for your heart. There's still a lot of calories, we don't want to do that. So we really want to limit the amount of fat that we're taking in period, but when we do choose those fats, we want to make sure that they're a little bit heart healthier. Um, we can also, you know, if we're choosing something like an olive oil and a canola oil over a vegetable oil, we want to make sure that we're doing that. We want to make sure that we're choosing liquids over solids because they're just going to be a little bit healthier for us. We can also reduce, so you can use less of the fat. You don't feel like you have to use what everything is called for. You know, if, if something calls for a certain amount of it, don't feel like you have to use it. You can replace it with other things. I haven't made brownies for a long time, but you can make brownies, instead of using the oil that it calls for, you can use black beans, you can use applesauce. So even trying to reduce the amount, even if you're using a healthy oil, you still have other ways that you can put healthier things in there and you get fiber from those foods. So it's another great way to incorporate some fiber into your diet when you're doing that. Um, and that comes along with replacing, you know, just using the black beans and the applesauce instead of the oil. So there's a lot of different things that we can do. There's other fruit purees that you can use. You can use a strawberry puree. We just, a lot of times we think of applesauce because it's already made and it's easier to find. So it just makes it a little easier. And when we're talking about all these substitutions, we're also looking, about e looking for easy, convenient things to utilize. We don't want to make it very difficult because then people think that they don't have the time to do all this stuff. We want it to be realistic. We want it to be usable. We want people to actually take time to do this because it doesn't take very long. And so when we do the food demo, we're gonna show you that it just doesn't take very long to do healthier things. You can eliminate it. You don't have to use it. Uh, the one thing that Jill's gonna do when she cooks the, does the demo, she's gonna use water instead of oil. So you can use chicken broth. Uh, I recommend using the lower sodium chicken broth or a lower sodium vegetable or beef broth but you can also use water. That's one cool thing. You don't have to use oils. I think for many of these things that we're talking about, we always have it in our head that certain things we have to use, or they go with this, or they go with that. So when we talk about utilizing something different, we tend to have a hard time buying into it because it just doesn't seem like the norm for us. But if we can lean more towards that, we can definitely be a lot healthier in an easier and tastier way. When we talk about sodium, there are also some uh, ways we can uh, substitute instead of using salt, obviously herbs and spices. Um, something to keep in mind with using herbs and spices is they, or, or kind of what salt does, salt is a flavor carrier. So if you take that out and you use herbs and spices, you're still gonna have flavor. It may not have the same flavor and potential, but one trick is to use a drop of oil, which is also a flavor carrier. We like things with oil. 
or fat because they have more flavor. So kind of using that knowledge that a drop of that with my herb and spice will actually increase the flavoring ability. Uh, probably my favorite herb and spice combination is McCorm McCormick garlic and herb. Um, and we put that on meat, we put it on vegetable skin with a drop or two of olive oil. It's one place where I would use a little bit of oil. When we get to sauteing, I'm not gonna, I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, later, but I uh, really like those as, as alternatives for just using the salt. We can also just cut back, you know, if a recipe calls for a teaspoon, you can easily get by with a half teaspoon. You often don't need uh, as much. And one of the things we find is as you eat more fruits and vegetables and you learn to appreciate those flavors, you don't need a lot of that extra added salt. As you get away from it, you tend to not uh, like it as much. And also if you're not using a lot of sodium or salt, when you get something that's salty, it's really, really going to taste salty to you to have that. So at this point, we're going to take a little break. We're going to start talking about uh, what we're doing here for today. I know a lot of times uh, people have seen these things, portion size versus serving size. Our cups, our plates, everything has gotten bigger, and we've just grown to eat more food. And I think as we start to cut back, we realize we don't need as much food as we used to. When we talk about portion size, portion size is actually how much we eat versus serving size, which is what's listed on the nutrition fact label. We do really want to be careful. Um, sometimes people want to try to eat healthier, so they're looking at nutrition fact labels, and I will tell you nine times out of ten, and I'll just use orange juice as an example, it'll tell you the serving size is eight ounces, but a real serving size is four. So we really do want to be careful with how much food we're actually eating, because sometimes the serving sizes that are listed on the label are still a little bit larger than what we need. So we do want to pay attention to that. They don't always match. Um, Jill is making the cauliflower rice, so I'm going to let her talk about that just a little bit so you can see what she's using. And again, we're not going to use any oil for this. I'm going to cook the egg ahead. Um, you can cook it right with the cauliflower as well, but I kind of like my little egg pieces in my fried rice to be little egg pieces. So um, I wasn't sure. I haven't cooked eggs a lot without just that little bit of coating, but Earlier I tried it and it worked. So I did just a little bit of water and it didn't stick. It came off really well. I got it nice and dried down in little pieces. Then I'm going to take it out uh, and put it in a different dish when we go to saute the next thing. But I'm just going to periodically add a teaspoon or so of water and I'm not really good, I will confess, at measuring stuff. Um, so I tend to just kind of put it in and go with it and things don't always taste exactly the same. So there will be my confession that this is not, I'm just going to claim this is not analytical food science class. So uh, we do not have to measure exactly. But uh, so again, we're just going to, I'm going to saute the onions and the garlic, uh, and then we'll kind of add in vegetables because we are using frozen and we'll let those cook. And then the last thing we'll add is the, the cauliflower rice, which, or I should say riced cauliflower. So basically we bought it already chopped up in a frozen bag. Uh, you probably have a little bit more flavor if you do fresh, but you have to chop it up yourself then, or you can buy the, the cut up, but then you wanna make sure you use it um, if you buy fresh chopped uh, cauliflower. So we just did the frozen for convenience, and you do kind of have to balance out convenience uh, sometimes with, uh, with quality. So maybe, and I didn't think it was bad, it just may not have quite the same quality. So the eggs are good, but I don't have enough containers, so we're also going to be creative. We like to do that, put a little bit more water in, uh, and we'll get the onions sauteing, and then we'll move the eggs over. Because you don't like them overbaked or overcooked, so start that saute process. And then again, we'll be adding in frozen vegetables, and if you don't like these vegetables, you can pick something different. Um, on the back, I, we provided a recipe for this if you would like it. On the back side is also a recipe for stir fry, um, which to me stir fry is basically a little bit of protein of some sort. So whatever you have in your refrigerator, a little leftover, you know, chicken, beef, pork, beans, whatever, and you put vegetables with them and you season them a little bit. So whether you do some soy sauce or some sweet and sour or whatever flavor you like for your stir fry. But I think that a stir fry over this just makes me smile from ear to ear because we're going to make here, instead of a rice, it's a cauliflower, it's a vegetable product. And then we're going to eat stir fry, which is vegetable meat. It's like vegetable on vegetable. And, you know, I, I challenge you to eat too many vegetables. I have one time in my whole time here, which has been a long time, 
uh, met someone who maybe ate too many and they might have had some OCD stuff going on. But uh, you know, I challenge you to be the next person to eat too many vegetables. So I really do get excited when we can just do veggie on veggie. And again, if I can feed this to my kiddos and they don't complain, I am really excited about that. Uh, so we're just gonna do some sauteing. And like I said, we're gonna add, so I'm gonna let uh, you go out and talk a little bit more. And I will say, I don't like onions either. Onions and mushrooms are two of the things that I just don't really care for. But I did try it. I could not taste the onions at all. It was very tasty. So, you know, if you think that you might not like it, I would still encourage you to try it when it's done because that's the best time to try things is when you have the opportunity to try a sample because you never know when you might like something. If you are given a recipe and you have to go out and buy all the items and you have to spend money, sometimes you're not sure if it's going to turn out, if you're going to like it, but if you can actually see it, actually try it, and know that it's something that you would use, consume, then definitely take the opportunity to try it when we're finished. I just, we just do some slides up here, chicken Caesar salad. You know, we talk about portion control. You can see 20 years ago uh, what, a, what a chicken Caesar salad was at 390 calories, and today it's 790. Our portion sizes have grown, and for a lot of people, they think that salad is so good for them. Well, if you just eat the lettuce and you just eat vegetables on it, yes. But the reality is, the larger your salad becomes, the more of everything else you put on it, the more salad dressing you put on it. I did a grocery store, a virtual grocery store tour for a senior seminar class, and I put out the whole grocery store, and the first thing the girl, one of the students grabbed was the Olive Garden Italian dressing. It, it was ridiculous how much sodium was actually in that. So it's a very big eye opener when we're looking at salad dressings, we tend to use a lot. There's different techniques that you could do to use less, but for most people, they take that salad, they think they're eating healthy, and they pour a bunch of dressing, and they pour a bunch of everything else on it, and now the calories are increased. And this is why. I still continue to encourage people to eat just a regular side salad. But of course, I'm sure we all know, maintaining a healthy weight is balancing calories in and calories out. So it's very important uh, when you take some of these foods that are higher in calories. For whatever reason, I always like to use a candy bar as an example. And, in, and I think it's because there are so many different sizes of candy bars now. And some people like some sweet things every once in a while. And it's probably better to eat a candy bar versus a whole bag of something else if you have a sweet tooth. But in general, if you look at that candy bar, it's about 250 calories. And you can see here, if you've got an extra 400 calories, what are you going to have to do to burn it off? Well, I know for myself, I'm a smaller person, so I tend to not burn as many calories as what maybe a taller, heavier person might, but when I get on the elliptical for 30 minutes, I'm lucky to burn 100, maybe 150 calories. So I haven't even really put a debt into the candy bar, not to mention anything else that I might have touched for that day. And sometimes we look at those foods and say, oh, it's just a little bit, oh, it's not that much. You know, I can burn it off doing this, or I can burn it off doing that, and we just don't realize. So sometimes we really have to have those eye openers to make that choice, is it truly worth it for us to do that? And so when we utilize some of these food substitutions, I think it's wonderful because we can get more with less, and I think that is very important. So if you want to burn the 400 calories off, you got to walk your dog for an hour and 20 minutes. The dog might love you for it. I don't know. It just depends on if you are able to walk an hour and 20 minutes. But it's certainly a long time just for 400 calories. So you have to decide, if, is it really worth it to you? And I think when we look at barriers to change, you know, we talk about this, we hear about it, we get the education, but knowledge is certainly power. The more we know, the more we can do. A lot of times people will say, you know, I know I need to eat less, I know I need to exercise, I need to do better, but do they really know how to go about doing it? And I think planning is such a huge portion of that. If you are planning your meals and you're planning what you're going to do, it makes it so much easier when that day gets here. So having the knowledge and the tools to utilize is going to make a huge difference in you being more successful with what you're doing. And then the other option is to accept it. I think sometimes we feel like, you know, I just want to be able to do what I want when I want. Why do I have to watch this? Why do I have to watch that? But what you have to come to the realization is that we just want you to be healthier. We're trying to get the world to be healthier, not to punish you, not to make you feel miserable, but if you like fruits and vegetables and you like a lot of these things, there's no reason why you shouldn't be eating them because they're good for you. And the more we eat those foods, we're gonna crave more of those foods versus the processed, high sugar, high fat, high salt foods. So we really do that. A lot of times people will say they don't have time. And that's why we're trying to show you, yeah, we're using the rice, cauliflower, frozen, but it saves time. It's still a good product. It's still going to be better than something else that you might try. And you're going to get more fiber in the rice, cauliflower than you are in the white rice. So a lot of times people think they don't have that time. And so if you can figure out those ways, as Jill said, to put convenience with more natural, you can find a happy medium there. 
And then, of course, money. Sometimes people will complain that you know they don't have the money to eat healthy or it's just too expensive. You know, watch sales. Figure out a plan. Plan your menus. Don't just go into the store and have good ideas and go up and down the aisles and buy things because you think they're healthy and think you're going to use them. Plan that meal so you know what you're buying, so you actually save money. Um, I'm learning about the Walmart has the new thing where you can order your groceries online and pick it up. Kroger has it. I think Meyer has it. A lot of new stores are doing that, which is pretty sweet. Um, you're not getting the exercise walking through the store, but when you go on there, sometimes you tend to purchase only what you need versus adding extra stuff, and you can see your bill add up. So you might have a tendency to take things off that you know maybe you don't really want to spend that money on. So I think for that, some people might make better decisions when it comes to time and money and just trying to mix those and have a good combination to do things a little bit healthier. Of course, we're going to throw the plate method up there because that's what we love, that's what we do. I truly believe, Jill truly believes that if you follow the plate method, you can't go wrong. I mean, the fruits and the vegetables are there, the grains are there, the lean proteins are there, the dairies are there. So if you follow that, you're going to automatically get something healthy. And it's very colorful, it's very visual. You can put it on your refrigerator. It's a reminder when you open the fridge and you open the cupboards, this is what you want to do most of the time. Um, and so we've got another option, you know, filling your plate, just reiterating, you know, foods in their most natural state when possible. Um, sometimes people feel, oh, I don't want to have to go to the grocery store every couple days because everything's going to go bad. But that doesn't typically happen. I mean, things are going to last, so you can get them in the natural state, utilize them. Have that plan so when you buy apples and you buy fruit, other fruits and you buy other produce, that you're going to use them in your meals so they don't go bad. Making sure that your fiber foods have five grams or more. Um, your sodium is 150 milligrams or less and your fat is less than five grams per serving. So when you do that and you eat according to the plate method, you're automatically gonna get all of those things right there. So in general, the goals, 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day, 2300 milligrams of sodium, um, the 50 to 60 grams of fat each day. So you can kind of plan that out and split it up into three meals and snacks if you want to. Um, it's just a kind of a guideline to help you, especially if you want to know where to start, if you need numbers. Some people are numbers people. I like to keep things as simple as possible. And one time I had this patient, it was a guy that came in, I started talking about numbers, and he's like, the only thing I heard you say was all the numbers, the calories I need to eat, this, that. He goes, I didn't pay attention to anything else because he was an analytical guy, so he, he really got into the numbers. Other people, when you give them numbers, they go over their head. They just want something to look at tell me what to do so I don't have to count calories and I don't have to count my fiber and protein and fat and everything else. Don't be shy. We're going to encourage you to come up because that gets you moving instead of just sitting.